Good afternoon. My name is Rudy Prosser. I'm an instructor with ESRI based out of the Olympia, Washington office. Joining me today is Nathan Warmerdam, a product engineer with the geoprocessing team here in Redlands. We want to welcome you all to today's live training seminar. Today's topic is authoring and publishing geoprocessing services. So in today's, we're going to discuss uh, an overview of ArcGIS server geoprocessing. We'll take a look at a pro uh, authoring geoprocessing services, publishing geoprocessing services. The format will be, we'll present these topics followed by a software demonstration, a review, and an opportunity to ask questions and get answers to those questions. The first section is an over overview of ArcGIS server geoprocessing services. We'll define what a geoprocessing server is, We'll also look at the benefits of sharing tools via ArcGIS server and how a geoprocessing service works. A geoprocessing service is a GIS web service that serves a set of geoprocessing tools, executes a tool on the server, and returns results over the web. ArcGIS server geoprocessing services allow you to take a process that might have once been done manually, automate it using a model and model builder or a Python script, and make it available to others as a service. When the user makes use of the service, it executes not on the user's machine, but on the server hosting the service. And the results are then passed back to the user. So it's a way of allowing you to take work and, and give it to someone else, or give it to the service. The benefits of a geoprocessing service are many. It allows you to share models and tools with other users. It allows you to capture an analyst's expertise and present that expertise in the form of a model or tool that others can use. It centralizes processing of data on the server, allowing lightweight clients access to heavy-duty processing. It also provides advanced and geoprocessing operations for those lightweight clients. And perhaps the greatest benefit of using a geoprocessing service, no programming is required to create and use geoprocessing services. So how does a geoprocessing service work? Well, in this scenario, we have a client application that is going to take, make use of a geoprocessing service. The client application can be ArcMap or Arc Catalog. It could be ArcGIS Explorer or a web mapping application. ArcGIS Server is running on a separate server machine, and it's hosting our ge geoprocessing services. There can be one or more geoprocessing services running on the ArcGIS Server. All of the services running on the ArcGIS Server are running as the ArcGIS SOC user a user account that is created during ArcGIS server installation uh, for, to, for services. Now, in ArcMap or Arc Catalog, if you were to add a toolbox from your geoprocessing service to Arc Toolbox, what happens at that point is a query is sent over to ArcGIS server asking what tools do you have and what is their usage. ArcGIS server responds to that qu query with information about those tools. The client application is then responsible for generating the dialog boxes that the users interact with, and it uses the information that ArcGIS Server has sent it. Users complete those input boxes and hit OK. At this point, the information is sent on to ArcGIS Server, which receives the input and then uses that information to ex execute the tool, generating a set of results and then returning those results to the client. The client application is then responsible for displaying those results and allowing the users to interact with them. So in this first section, we took a look at a geoprocessing service, its definition and benefits. We took a look at how a geoprocessing service works, and we explained a little bit about the ArcGIS SOC user. The second section we're going to look at is authoring a geoprocessing service. For today, we have a scenario that we're going to work within. We have an existing model that was built in ArcMap that we want to publish to ArcGIS Server. So this model already exists in a toolbox. To publish it, we need to examine and modify some of the model's resources. So we're going to look at the model parameters, source data used in the model and map, intermediate data, and the model output. The third step in the scenario is that everything is located on the server. Now, this is just one of many scenarios that are possible with ArcGIS Server. So when you author a model for publication, you need to ask yourself, 
What do I need to do to successfully publish a model to ArcGIS server? It's important to realize that changes to any existing model and toolboxes are likely, uh, are going to be likely. You need to consider what your geoprocessing service is going to do and how you want it to behave. And you need to think about how results are going to appear when they return to the client application. So we're going to take a look at some of the basic uh, parameters that you might have to change. The first thing we're going to take a look at is model parameter data types. Geoprocessing services support a subset of the data types that ArcMap and Arc Catalog support. We can submit text information, numeric information, date information. We can support layers from our map document. We can support raster data sets as inputs and outputs to ArcGIS server. Feature classes and tables are only available to us as outputs. So if we want to use a feature class or a table or information that is in the form of geometry or tabular information and submit that to ArcGIS server, we have to use a feature set and a record set to input that geometry and tabular information. Now, when we create a feature set or record set in our model, we right click and say new feature set, and we can set the basic characteristics of this uh, variable. We do that by importing a schema and symbology from an existing layers in the map or feature classes that are in a geo database or tables that are in the database. We can even use a layer file as you see in the selector properties uh, in the illustration below where we're using importing the schema and symbology from a layer file. The second item we need to examine when uh, publishing authoring a, a geoprocessing service is the source data used in that geoprocessing service. Source data comes in two forms, file-based data sources, such as shape files, file-based geodatabases, or personal geodatabases running on Microsoft Access. If you're going to use a file-based data source, you need to make sure that the ArcGIS SOC user has access and permissions to that data. Remember, geoprocessing services run as the ArcGIS SOC user. If you're using an ArcSDE data source, you also need to make sure that the ArcGIS SOC user has access to the database and to the data within that database. You also need to make sure that the process can connect to your SDE database. And you do this by creating an unambiguous ArcSDE connection file. Once you have your connection file, you'll also need to make sure you change data paths to this, use this new Arc SDE connection file. The third item we need to examine when authoring our geoprocessing service is intermediate data. This is data that gets generated by as output of one processing step and is then used as input to another processing step and is temporary. It's simply intermediate data that will be deleted at the completion of the model. Now, you want to make sure you write intermediate data to a Scratch workspace. This can be done in one of two ways. We can set model data, intermediate data, as managed by simply right-clicking on the intermediate data and choosing managed. This will write it to the Scratch workspace that we've declared. Or we can use the Scratch workspace inline variable and designate that we want the data that we're creating to be written to the Scratch workspace. While authoring our model, if we've set the Scratch workspace, any tools that we create will then use that Scratch workspace that we've designated uh, in ArcMap and Arc Catalog. When publishing the model, the tool will then use the Scratch workspace that ArcGIS Server has created. The fourth item we need to look at is model output. For your clients to see results or to get those results sent to them, we need to make sure we set output as a model parameter so that it can be returned to the client. We also want to make sure that we write the model output someplace where ArcGIS server has permission to write that. And that's typically the Scratch workspace. We can set uh, output as a model parameter simply by right clicking on an output and choosing model parameter. And we can set the Scratch workspace by opening up the output data set and using the percent scratch workspace inline variable to designate this, create it, and send it to a particular folder, or to, a, in this case, a uh, second option, to a file-based geodatabase named Scratch. Now, why, why all this concentration on uh, Scratch workspaces? 
Well, when ArcGIS server is installed, an ArcGIS jobs directory gets created. And this directory is used explicitly to store data generated by the geoprocessing service. So any feature set input you've specified, intermediate data that gets generated as the, the processing service executes, and the final output data are written to the ArcGIS jobs folder. When a geoprocessing service is used, a dedicated temporary directory is, is created to support the service. Each user who connects in, or each use of the geoprocessing service, will have its own dedicated scratch workspace. And then the data generated by the service is then written to this directory. As you see in the illustration at the bottom of this slide, we have the ArcGIS jobs directory, and within the ArcGIS jobs directory is a folder, the Hydrologic Modeling Toolbox GP server. This is the actual geoprocessing service, and then within it, we've got four cases of execution. These are folders that are going to be used as scratch use workspaces by each of the individuals who are connected in. The last item we're going to take a look at is symbology. You can control how inputs and outputs appear, and you can also control the type of geometry used with an input if you're using an interactive uh, service. So to author a service, you can set the, in, the symbology for the inputs and the outputs. So on the left-hand side, we've got an input. This is a feature set, and we're using a layer file to set the symbology and also to determine the geometry of this, the feature set. For the output, we can go to the Layer Symbologies tab and designate that we want the output presented in a particular way, as specified by the layer file. So in the software demonstration, here we have uh, a model that we're going to execute. The model in our toolbox is Select and Count. It's going to use data that's coming from our map document, and we have data coming from several resources. We have a shape file that is hosting cities for the Pacific Northwest, and then we have two, feature, two layers that are coming from an SDE Geo database the state's layer, and the county's layer. The purpose of this model was to allow users to select either a state or several states, or a single county or multiple counties, and then determine the cities that fall within those particular selections, and also to gener generate some statistical information about that set of selected features. So to execute the model, we first determine uh, the layer we want to work with, in this case, counties, and we need to select that set of counties. But before we do that, let's take a look at the model itself. The model has two inputs. One input is the cities layer from our map, and the second input is the selectable layers. The selectable layers is of type feature layer. It allows us to actually specify or allow our users to interactively select a map a layer from our map document to use in processing. We're going to use these two inputs into our clip command, which is going to generate a new feature class called selected cities. Now we specified selected cities as a parameter so that we can see it in the map document, so the results will be returned. Selected cities will then be used as inputs into the frequency tool, and this is going to use a column from the selected cities attribute table to generate a city's frequency table. This table then will be passed into a Python script called get percentages, which is going to do two things. It's going to add a couple of columns to a the table, and it's also going to do some calculations using the totals that are found in the city's frequency table and write those to a couple of new columns that we just added. Notice that the selectable layers is a parameter that we're going to use in our model. The selected cities is a parameter. This is going to be a returned results. And then the city's frequency final is also a parameter. This is also a returned results. So let's execute the model. So I've set my selected layer to counties. I've grabbed my interactive selection tool in ArcMap. And I simply drag and drop a box. This highlights a set of features, selects them, that I can use as inputs into my model. So I'm going to execute the model at this point. In select and count, I can determine which of the layers in the maps I want to use as inputs, in this case, the counties layer. And I also can designate where to write the outputs. 
clicking on OK causes the model to execute. When the model is done, it closes, and we will see in our map that we now have a new layer called Selected Cities, drawn in red, and we see all the selected cities that fell within the counties that we had chosen. Switching to the Source tab, we also see that a new table has been added, and this table contains some information about the nature of those cities. Frequency was run on the feature command, and in each unique instance of the value found in the feature column, is counted up and placed in the frequency column. Our geoprocessing tool, or our script, added the percentages column and the population percentages column, and then determined what percentage of the total the frequency is, and what population percentages the population is for all of the, the values that are listed. So in this case, we can look and see that cities with a population of less than 10,000 correspond to almost 90% of the total number of cities we have, but only a quarter of the population. So this is the model that we want to publish to ArcGIS server. So, to publish this model, we need to take four things into account. We need to look at the model inputs, we need to look at uh, the data sources, the intermediate data that gets generated, and the outputs. Before we execute the model and actually make the changes to the model before for publication, there's a couple of things that we want to check in our ArcMap environment. These are found on the geoprocessing options uh, when we look at the options dialog. The first thing we want to make sure is that we've unchecked the results or temporary by default option. We'd like to actually see results in our map. The second thing that we want to look at is we want to make sure that we've set the Scratch workspace. And the Scratch workspace is currently set to a folder called in this GP library folder called Scratch. And so any, any intermediate data and the output data it will be written to the Scratch workspace. Next, we're going to start making changes in our model. So let's edit this. The first thing we need to realize is the model inputs that we submitted when we ran it in ArcMap consisted of a set of selected features in a layer and a map. Now, most of the ArcGIS clients, for instance, Arc Explorer 2 and the web mapping application, ArcGIS Explorer and the web mapping application, don't have any selection tools available to them. So we need to address that in the model. So to get a selected set that we can pass through the rest of the model, we're going to have to create and do that here. So the way we're going to do that first is we're going to create a variable. This variable is going to be a feature set, which means that we can provide interactive input. So we select feature set and click on OK. And to give myself a little room, I'm going to zoom out on my model. And we're going to use this feature set as an input, one of the inputs, into the select by lo location command. The second thing we're going to do here is we're going to grab the selectable layers. This is, this is used to identify a layer in the map document that we want to use as our selector. So I'm going to click on the link and break that link by deleting it. And I'm going to use this new this selected, selectable layers variable as an input into the select by location command, which I'm going to use to perform the actual selection. So to find the select by location command, I switch over to the index and in our toolbox and just type select and click down a couple of times and there's the select by location. Locating the tool by clicking on the locate button and then drag this tool into my map doc, into my model. So my two inputs into select by location are going to be the layer I'm going to use to make my selections and the layer I want to make the selections from. So the layer I want to make the selection from is going to be specified by the selectable layers. And the layer I want to use to make the selection is going to be specified by my feature set. Clicking on OK will enable this most of this to highlight. 
But right now, we have no idea of the geometry that we're going to use for this selection, nor how we're going to present it. So we're going to bring up the properties of our feature set, and we're going to specify a schema and a symbology by pointing to a layer file that I've got stored uh, in my geoprocessing library folder. So I go to my geoprocessing connection, open up the tool data, and in here I have a polygon selection layer file that will draw those, the selected features or the selection tool in yellow. Clicking on Add specifies the schema and the symbology. Clicking on OK should highlight the feature set. Now, I don't know if I'm going to be getting counties in or states in. This is the selection here allows me, the selectable layers allows the user to specify which layer they want to work with. So I'm going to change the name of this variable, this output, from counties to selected features. And then I'm going to use this output as the second input into the clip command. So we're going to use these features to clip the cities to generate the selected cities feature class. So I'm going to open up clip and then use the selected features and click on OK. And you see the rest of the colors, uh, rest of the elements in the model color in. So now I've got my interactive inputs specified. The next thing I want to do is check my parameters that I'm going to use as inputs and outputs. Now, selectable layers was already a parameter. We simply re disconnected it from clip and connected it to the select by location. Selected cities is already a parameter. This is, will be the output of the clip command and will be passed back as a layer that we can see in ArcMap. And that the city's frequency final table is also a parameter. This will be passed back. The last thing we need to do is make sure we model model the parameter for the feature set so we can actually see that in the tool. The next item we're going to look at is intermediate data. Now, the intermediate data in this case is just the table that comes from the frequency. We generated a new table when we ran the get percentages command. So I want to mark the intermediate data, uh, mark the city's frequency data as intermediate, and I also want to make sure that it's written to the temporary folder. The simplest way to do that is by making it managed. When you make data ma intermediate data managed, or you make any data managed in ArcGIS or in your model, when it's published to ArcGIS server, ArcGIS server is automatically going to write it to its Scratch workspace. You can't control where it goes once you've marked it as managed. The last thing we're going to take a look at the model is where we're going to write our final output. Now we've got two data sets that are our final outputs. We have a feature class called Selected Cities that's going to draw our selected cities. And we have the table that's generated by running the frequency command and the get percentages Python script. And we want to make sure they're written to the appropriate location. So I'm going to open this up. And where we want them written to is our temporary Scratch workspace. So I'm going to simply highlight the first two items in the path and replace that with the Scratch workspace inline variable. And to save myself some typing, I'm going to highlight that and copy it so I don't have to enter it in again. Now, this will make sure that we write that the output to the Scratch workspace. In fact, it's going to write the feature class as a feature class named Selected Cities in the Scratch, in a file-based geodatabase named Scratch. We also need to set the output for the city's frequency final down here. So we'll open it up and replace its path with the Scratch workspace variable, inline variable. So paste and OK. And now our two outputs, the selected cities and the city's frequency final, will be written to our Scratch workspace. One last check of the model before we save it. We've got our four parameters specified. We set the intermediate data as managed, and we des specified to write the output data to our Scratch workspace. So we've done three of the four items that we need to check. The last item we need to check are some layers in the map document. Now we want to make sure that uh, ArcGIS server has access to all the data that we're actually using in this map document. When we publish this model called Select and Count to ArcGIS server, we're going to actually publish it as part of a map document. 
So first thing we want to do is make sure that we've got our cities available. So we're going to open up the properties of that. And on the source tab, we can see that it's being written to our server into a folder called demo data. Now, since everything is stored on the server, we don't have to do anything extra here to make sure that ArcGIS server has access to it. If, however, this were out on a network somewhere, on our local area network, we'd have to make sure that we share the folder in which the data resides and then grant the ArcGIS SOC user access to that particular folder. The other two layers in the map are coming from SDE. So we'll need to make sure that ArcSDE has a, the ArcGIS SOC user has access to the ArcSDE Geo database. The simplest way to do that is to go to our catalog and then go down to our SDE connections. So we're going to come down to our database connections. And notice here we've got a connection to our SDE Geo database. I'm simply going to right click on that connection and copy it and then paste it into my geoprocessing library folder. And then in ArcMap, change the paths on my SDE layers to use that connection file. So I'll right click on the states layer, go to its properties, on the source tab, set the da data source, go to my GP library, and there's my connection. So I'll add that. And then in my SDE Geo database, specify which layer to use, in this case, the selected states layer. I'll repeat, repeat this process with the counties layer. Set the data source, point to the counties layer, click on add, click on OK. Now my two SDE layers are using a connection file that's located uh, next to my toolbox. The reason for doing this is that your typical connection that you use, your SDE connection that you used while making the model originally and making the map originally was stored in your personal profile. And the ArcGIS SOC user does not have access to your personal profile. So we need to make sure the connection that is being used is someplace where the ArcGIS SOC user will have access to it. So now we've got our data set. Uh, and we're just about ready to execute the model as a test to make sure all our changes work. So a couple of things I'm going to do here. I'm going to right click and remove this, the cities layer. I'm going to go back to the sources tab and remove the table. And I'm going to make sure I've cleared any selections that I've specified. We'll go ahead and save this map and give our model a try. So I'm going to open my model. And now when the model opens, notice that I've got, still got my selectable layers there. I've got my two uh, uh, data sets that are going to be returned, the selected cities data set and the cities frequency final. And now I have a new uh, item in my dialog called the feature set. And it has associated with it a button that allows me to digitize geometries on the map. So I'm just going to simply drag and drop a rectangle on the map. And notice it was a polygon object, and that was determined by the schema. And it's drawn in yellow, and that was determined by the symbology that, I, that, was, that was identified by this, the layer file that I used when I defined that feature set. Clicking on OK will cause the model to execute and return the results. So once it's done, it goes away. It highlights all the selected features, the cities that fall within the selected features that I specified from the counties layer. And if I switch to the source tab, there I've got my table, which I can open up and look at the different categories of cities that fall within the area designated and the percentages and population and number of cities. So a quick review. We looked at, when authoring our model, source data management, model parameters, intermediate data management, and the model output. We also talked a little bit about the ArcGIS SOC user and how the ArcGIS SOC user must have access to all model components. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Nathan to answer some of your questions. <clears throat> Thanks, Rudy. Um, I have a number of questions here that I want to get to, so I'm just going to get straight into it. The first question comes from Rob in Monterey Park, and he asks, what is a SOC? 
Um, that's a good question. The uh, GIS server itself is composed of two parts, really. It has the server object manager, which we call the SOM, and the server object containers, which we call the SOC. So to answer your question, SOC means server object container. Um, the SOM manages the, the services running on the server, whereas the, the SOCs are the host of the services. They are the process that actually runs the service. So that's the definition of SOC. Um, and thanks for that question. The next question that we have is um, has been mentioned by numerous people, and we're going to take this one from Beth and Sanger. And she says, what level of ArcGIS server do I need to author and publish a geoprocessing service? Um, in order to author and publish geoprocessing services, you need to purchase at least a standard edition of ArcGIS server. When you do that, you will get you have the ability to author and publish services um, that contain ArcView level GP tools, and you'll be able to purchase optional server extensions of Network Analyst and Data Interop. Um, if you want a little bit more functionality, a little bit more power, and be able to use all of the Arc Info level GP tools, you'll have to purchase the um, advanced edition of ArcGIS Server. And with the advanced edition, you also have the option of purchasing further extensions such as Spatial Analyst and 3D Analyst. Um, this also leads into another question that we get quite a bit here. And I'm going to take this question from Khalid, who is, who is uh, taking our stream in Baghdad. Uh, he asks, what ArcGIS desktop license level is required for, clients, for the client-side application? Um, that really depends on what client you want to use to consume geoprocessing services. You can technically have clients that require no license from ESRI at all. For example, um, you can download ArcGIS Explorer, and ArcGIS Explorer will allow you to connect to any server that is hosting geoprocessing services uh, that you have access to and let you consume those services with that client. And that does not require you purchase any licenses from ESRI at all. Uh, furthermore, if someone authors a web application and serves that web application up and that web application actually uh, consumes a geoprocessing service, then anyone who has access to that web application on the internet, uh, which can be quite a few people, will have the ability to consume the geoprocessing services that have been um, opened up or given to the user to use uh, in that web application. So you don't need a license there either as a consumer. You would need a, a license to build that web mapping application, but to use it, you would not. So, But on the other hand, you can also have desktop like ArcMap and ArcCatalog be the consumers of your service. And for that, you obviously do need a license. Um, for the next question, I'm going to turn it back over to Rudy just real quick. And we have a question from Jason in Mansfield who asks, why do you have to replicate the SDE connection file? Why can't you just use the existing one? That's a good question, Jason. Um, we need to replicate the SDE connection file because when you create your connection, if you go down in our catalog to where we've got our database connections, those are actually stored under your personal profile. And the ArcGIS server processes typically won't have access to that unless you've chosen to go in and work your way down to where those are actually located. Um, stored in your personal profile and then share that folder out. It's far simpler rather than trying to locate and share that folder simply to copy the SDE connection file to the same location as your toolbox and in publication then share that, that one location covering both the toolbox and the connection file. Thanks Rudy, that was, that was an excellent answer. Um, we have another question. This one is from uh, Jane, who's coming to us from Redlands. And she asks, uh, what's the difference between intermediate and managed in Model Builder? Um, and that's a really good question that a lot of users sometimes get confused on. The intermediate setting is in Model Builder says, OK, if I set this intermediate setting, it means that I want the data to be deleted after this model runs. So it may be a temporary data set that gets created but is only needed to be is only used by the model during that particular run of the model and so it gets deleted after the model runs. That's great. You still have control over where that intermediate data is written to so you could write it to say C temp. On the other hand with managed and when you right click a, a variable in model builder and set it to managed it means that you're giving control over the the output of that particular process or the location of that data, you're giving it completely over to the application um, that is running the model. So 
and you don't have the ability to tell that data where it's going to go to uh, if you set something to manage it and then you run a, a map sorry if you run a model that has some data set to manage it means that when ArcMap runs it's going to follow its rules for writing data to the scratch workspace and write that data to whatever scratch workspace it has it's not something that uh, you wrote you typed into the model or anything like that and what's important about that is that it gives it over to the control over to the application so that when ArcGIS server runs the model it means that ArcGIS server will write that managed data to its own scratch workspace which will be unique for each process that is submitted to um, the server for that geoprocessing service. So I think we're going to uh, send it back over to Rudy for the rest of the presentation and another demo. Thanks, Nathan. So the last section we're going to look at is publishing a geoprocessing service. And in this section, we're going to take a look at the process of publishing a geoprocessing service. We'll look at ArcGIS server access to the toolbox and the map. We look at what to publish, where we can publish either a toolbox or a map with a tool layer. And we'll take a look at some geoprocessing service options. Now, I can publish from one of two places. I can publish in our catalog by either right-clicking on a resource, say a map document, a toolbox, or, and saying published ArcGIS server. Or I can start on the server itself and use the add new service option to specify a lot of the parameters on that service, including the resources that are going to be published. The exact same thing can be done in ArcGIS Server Manager. The difference is in our catalog, you're using a desktop application. In ArcGIS Server, you're using a web-based application. The important thing to realize when publishing your toolbox or publishing your map and toolbox is that when you publish your map document or toolbox, ArcGIS Server reads its contents and stores information about the location of the map and toolbox and all the individual parameters. It does not copy the map or toolbox to the server. What this means that ArcGIS server must al always have access to the map or toolbox after you've published it. So if the service, server should have to reboot, it can restart the services. It still has to have access to those locations. You can do this in several ways. Uh, the simplest way is to copy the map or toolbox and all the supporting objects to the server. That's the method that we're using for these demonstrations. You can also share the folder where the map or toolbox currently resides on the local area network, and then make sure the ArcGIS SOC process has access to that folder, the ArcGIS SOC user, or you can copy in the map or toolbox and all the supporting objects to an existing shared folder. So those are the three options for making sure that the ArcGIS server processes have access to the toolbox and the map. Copy them to the server, share the folder where they're currently located, or copy them to a uh, currently shared folder. Now you can choose to publish a toolbox as a standalone object. This will create a single geoprocessing service and all the tools within the toolbox are published. So you could have several uh, geoprocessing tools that do some high level GIS analysis and then publish them as a library that other users could take advantage of. The advantage of this is that you can then send results to the client. You want to send the results to the client. You can make, also make the clients responsible for displaying those results. And if you want to use what we call synchronous behavior. Now, this is a behavior that can be as, assigned to any of the geoprocessing services. And we'll take a look at it in a moment. You can also publish a map that has what's called a tool layer. Uh, in this case, the map document contains what appears to be a tool. Uh, and you add a tool to a map document simply by dragging and dropping the tool out of its toolbox onto the table of contents of your map document. This will create two services, a geoprocessing service, which is responsible for executing the model, and a map service, which is used to provide input and display the output to that model. You can publish a map document if you want to allow users to select layers in the map, as we did in our demonstration, or you want the server to draw the results, and you don't want to send any of the results onto the client. Now, once you've published your service, you have some properties or parameters that you can specify for that service. These include the execution mode and the maximum number of records that the server can return to the client. Now, under execution mode, we have two modes. These are asynchronous and synchronous. 
async in asynchronous mode the results are going to be saved on the server and the results can be drawn by the server and the client is free to do other tasks while the service is executing so in arcmap you could pan and zoom you could run other tools while the job is running and you can also monitor the execution of the process on arcgis server in synchronous mode this is the faster of the two modes and the results on the server are temporary the client is then responsible for drawing the results and the big difference the client waits until the job is completed and the results are returned so in synchronous mode once you click on the ok button after you filled out the dialogues for the geoprocessing service uh, you won't be able to do anything until the geoprocessing service completes in other words you'll see an hourglass in your application the last item we're going to take a look at is the maximum number of records. Now you can think of this as a limit or a backstop to prevent users from sending far too much information down to the client application. It specifies the maximum number or the maximum amount of data that can be served to the client application. Default is 500 uh, records. Now in the software gener demonstration, we're going to go ahead and publish this map that we've been created with its toolbox. So here we have uh, our layers in the map. And we've got our selected cities. We've also got uh, a few other items that we want to make sure that we clear before we actually publish this. So the first thing I'm going to do is, is clear my selected sets. And then I'm going to drag my tool, in this case select and count my model, up into the table of contents from my map and release it. So now I have what appears to be a group layer. And in that group layer, I have a single layer called selected cities. You can think of this as your model. Now, I want to get rid of the original selected cities that are there. So I'm going to right click and remove that. And I'm also going to uncheck the select and count because I don't want to have it display until after a user has generated results and they've passed it back. So now I have my uh, map all set, ready to go. So I'm going to save this out and quit from Arc Map, and then go back to our catalog where I'll publish it. Now I'm going to publish this from our catalog. I could just as easily publish it using ArcGIS Server Manager, but I already have ca our catalog up and running. And I'm going to publish it by right-clicking and choosing Publish to ArcGIS Server. Now it's already got the server uh, uh, identified. It's given me a default name, the same name of my map document, and I can either create a new folder in which to place this server or I can service or use an existing folder. This allows me to organize my services. So I'm going to put it in the geoprocessing service and click on next. At this point in time, ArcGIS server is interrogating the map document and identifying that there is a tool layer in it. Once it's identified there's a tool layer, it enables the geoprocessing capability. And so that's why we see geoprocessing checked at this point in time. We've also got the mapping capability, which is always enabled. And we've got other capabilities that we could choose to turn on if we so wish. Clicking on next gives me a summary telling me the name of my services. So I have a map service and a geoprocessing service. And also what's the URLs for those services. Clicking on finish. We'll generate the services and start them up on ArcGIS server. It will also switch me over to uh, my administration connection. Now, a couple of things to remember about publishing services to ArcGIS server. To publish a server service of any type, be it a map service or a geoprocessing service, you have to be a member of the ArcGIS admin role on the server. So only members of that particular role can right click and say publish to ArcGIS server or to use the um, add new service uh, option. Also, only members of the ArcGIS admin role can manage the services that are found on ArcGIS server. So now that we've got our service here, let's demonstrate that it actually works. So we're going to go ahead and use ArcMap to do that. We could do this just as easily in uh, a web mapping application or in ArcGIS Explorer, but ArcMap's right here uh, and we'll take advantage of it. So 
uh, the first thing I'm going to do is add data. Now, rather than add data from file-based data sources or SDE data sources, I'm going to navigate down to my GIS server's connection, use my user connection to my ArcGIS server, open up the geoprocessing folder, and notice I've got my map document, my map service there waiting for use. So clicking on add, adds it to my map, requests the map from the server, and the server generates the map and passes it back. To use the toolbox, I need to add the toolbox to Arc Toolbox. And notice it already remembers, since I added the map service first, it remembers where I got it from. So it's already specified that we're going to the GIS servers to a user connection, looking in the geoprocessing folder on my ArcGIS server instance. And there's my toolbox. So I'll click on that and choose Open. And in our toolbox, scroll down here, I've got my Pacific Northwest uh, toolbox. And within it, I've got my one uh, tool, select and count, which I can ex cause to execute. So it's open up. I can specify my, specify my selectable layers. So I can choose from either county, states, or cities. So we'll go ahead and leave it on counties. And then I have my feature set that allows me to drag and drop again that interactive box drawn in the schema that I specified and click on OK. Now, we're, we're running this in asynchronous mode. That's the default mode. And once it's submitted to the job, it says it's all done and it's off and running on the server. So I can actually sit here and zoom in to my map service. I can identify a layer in the map service. And I can also go down to the results tab and use this to monitor the execution. And so we can see the server messages that are being sent back. And once it's all done, we'll see a new layer gets added to the table of contents. And if I turn this layer on and zoom back to the full extent, you'll see that it, the features that fell within the counties that I specified are now being drawn in red. And if I want to look at the data, the table that gets returned, I need to right click and choose Get Data and switch to the Source tab. And here's the data set, the table that was uh, generated using the frequency command and the Python script and the results. So I can take a look and see that uh, there are 186 uh, cities with populations less than 10,000. It's 90% of the cities in the list, but only a quarter of the population. So at this point in time, I'd like to turn it over to, or actually do a quick review. We looked at uh, publishing a geoprocessing service. Uh, we talked about ArcGIS server having access to the toolbox or map. We, we talked about publishing a toolbox and publishing a map with a tool layer. And we set some of the geoprocessing service options such as the execution mode and the record limits. So I'll turn this over to Nathan to answer a few more of your questions. Thanks, Rudy. Um, got a number of questions here. I'm going to take the first one from Jeff and Stowe, and he asks, can Arc Reader use a published geoprocessing service? And the answer to that is no, it cannot. The uh, clients for geoprocessing services are, are, out, are any web application that you might write with the uh, web ADF. ArcGIS Explorer or the desktop products like ArcMap or Arc Desk or Arc Catalog. Um, but thank you for that question. Uh, the next question is uh, from Jeremy in Lexington. He says, if I have published a toolbox and I've created a geoprocessing service from it, and then I go and edit that toolbox, what do I have to do in order for the changes that I've made to the toolbox to be reflected in the geoprocessing service? The answer to that is that you need to restart the service. Restarting the geoprocessing service is the functional equivalent of republishing it. So um, make your changes, but if you want them to be reflected in the geoprocessing service, you should restart that service. That was a really good question. Um, I'm going to let Rudy answer the next question. And that question is, does Art Catalog only accept the Express edition of SQL Server? or other additions of SQL Server can be added to the database server node within the Arc Catalog? Well, 
I'm assuming that he's referring to Arc SDE running on SQL Server. And uh, we can use any of the editions of SQL Server. So it can be the Express Edition. It could be the Standard Edition. It could be the Enterprise Edition. It can be uh, SQL Server 2000, SQL Server 2005. So we can use any of the editions of SQL Server as the warehouse for our geographic data. Just remember that um, you'll need to have Arc SDE if you're going to do that. Uh, Mark from Boise asks, I assume I can use file geodatabases as well in all of this and I needn't have an SDE. Uh, the answer to that is yes, you can use file geodatabases for the source of your data. You can use file geodatabases, shape files, you know, coverages, CAD, SDE, it doesn't really matter as long as it's uh, readable by the geoprocessing framework and all those data types are, including all the raster formats. So that's a really good question too. Um, there's another question here, and this one's from Jake in, in Los Angeles, and he says this is really uh, detailed, a list of things that you need to do to publish geoprocessing service, and uh, is there some place where this is all written down so we can check it out? Uh, and actually, if you look at your, your viewer, there's a, um, there's a link that links you to the ArcGIS desktop online help. And if you look in that help, you'll see that there's a node on sharing tools and toolboxes and then a sharing tools on an ArcGIS server node. And inside that node, you'll find um, a step-by-step -step, uh, demonstration of how to create a geoprocessing service. It runs through and does both a standalone toolbox and a tool layer in the map. So thank you for that question. The next question is from Valentina in Gainesville. And the question is, what is the penalty if the managed property is not selected for the intermediate data? Um, this is an excellent question. The answer to this is that there is no penalty if you do not select manage for intermediate. However, uh, you do want to give the management of the intermediate data over to ArcGIS server. And that means that you either should select that your intermediate data should be uh, managed with that option when you right click, or you should use the scratch workspace inline variable that you saw Rudy use as well for the, for the outputs. Um, either one of those will allow your geoprocessing service to work correctly uh, after being, or your toolbox to work, your tool to work correctly after you publish it. But make sure that you do one of those things because if you do not select manage or you do not write it to the scratch workspace, then um, your geoprocessing service will likely end up not working absolutely correctly. Um, let's see, we have a few more questions here. I'm going to take a question here from Darcy in Tulsa. She asked, how does cleanup occur on the Scratch workspaces on the server? Um, that's more of a server administration question, and I believe that the, the cleanup is, um, is dictated as a part of uh, property on the folders of the server. So you can set a time for when those folders will be flushed out of all their contents. So all the job scratch data that is built up over time will get pushed out and um, uh, deleted for you so that you don't have too much stuff building up. I'm going to take another question from Owen in Atlanta. He says, do I need to consider pooled or not non-pooled options when authoring your processing service. Uh, you do not. You should just keep the default of um, pooled. So, so okay. keep the default of pooled. Uh, do not select not pooled. Pooled is the way forward for geoprocessing services. You do not gain any benefit from using not pooled. Um, I'm going to look, let's see, we got a few more questions. Does, I'm going to give this question to Rudy. Uh, the question is, does the ArcGIS SOC user need to be a user in the SDE? Okay. Um, so the question here is, does the ArcGIS SOC user need to be an SDE user? Um, it all depends on how you're authenticating uh, your accounts. If you're using your operating system authentication, then you definitely need to add uh, the SDE, your the account, ArcGIS SOC user to your geo database and then make sure it has permissions on the, the feature classes used in your service. If you're using uh, database authenticated authentication, then you can use, if you save the username and password as part of the connection file, then it can use the credentials that are found in the connection file. 
So that takes us to the end. Uh, before we go, we'd like to show you, share with you a few resources. We have two classes on ArcGIS Server. There's the introduction to ArcGIS Server, and then there's developing applications for ArcGIS Server. This comes in one of two flavors. There's, an app, uh, there's developing applications for the .NET environment, and there's also developing applications uh, using Java. We also have several other resources that you should take a look at. Uh, of course, on the support website, there are a lot of resources uh, within the ArcGIS desktop help. They're sharing tools and toolboxes. Also, within that same topic, there's a sharing tools on an ArcGIS server. And here's where you'll find a couple of tutorials uh, on publishing uh, a standalone toolbox and a tool with a map layer. Also, you'll find within the ArcGIS server help, there are also some ad uh, additional tutorials available to you. Now, I realize that we've covered a lot of uh, topics. There's a lot of things that you need to consider uh, when you uh, go about authoring and publishing your geoprocessing service. So to simplify things, we have a final checklist for authoring and publishing uh, that you can take a look at. So your comments help us to improve our seminars. Please take a moment to complete our survey. Just click the Give Us Feedback link to take the survey. We hope you've enjoyed today's seminar. On behalf of ESRI, I'd like to thank you all for attending.